Hello and welcome to a very special end zone. Each week, uh, we're actually going to try to bring you a report just on the NFC South. Seeing as how a lot of you guys are big fans and we're always interacting with you guys and trying to keep you on the up and up as much as possible. So, let's just jump right in. Last week, the Carolina Panthers uh, lost 12-7 to to the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, Russell Wilson had a decent day, 25 completions for 320 yards. There was no big rusher, though, for them. And uh, their top receiver was Baldwin, who only had 97 or 91 yards. Cam Newton, on the other hand, uh, threw for only 125 y- yards and a touchdown. Uh, Steve Smith only had 51 yards, and he caught the only touchdown receiving. And D'Angelo Williams actually had 16 carries for 76 yards. Now, the big key out of all that right there is the fact that D'Angelo Williams is starting to look like the old D'Angelo Williams before he got banged up and hurt a couple years ago. This could be a great sign for the Panthers. They need a running attack to kind of counteract uh, Cam having to do it the whole time, and then he can start airing out passes. Uh, There was a handful of turnovers, uh, sacks from each team, but for the most part, this was Seattle not knowing how to score, even though they were one of the highest scoring teams last year, and the Panthers kind of struggling to remember that the painted part of the field is the end zone. But I really think they're going to rebound this week, where Carolina will face Buffalo, who shouldn't have been in their week one game against the Patriots. Uh, Buffalo actually lost to New England with the last minute drive by Brady, who set up the game winning field goal by Gostowski. Uh, 23 21 was that one. But I'm going to say Carolina is going to beat Buffalo this week, and that's going to be 17 to 10. For all you Buffalo fans, no hate mail. Uh, I just I see you guys still as one of the bottom teams, and Carolina is actually an emerging team who possibly not this year, but next year has a chance at a playoff spot. Speaking of playoff teams, let's jump right into those New Orleans Saints. Uh, They won 23-17 against the Atlanta Falcons last week in what was, to me, one of the best games I watched all week. As you remember, it was one of my top five picks in my five spot to watch, and I actually got that one right in picking the Saints. Uh, For the most part, for Atlanta, typical Matt Ryan, 300-plus yards, Two touchdowns and the interception. The interception, not so much, but that's about par for the course for Matt Ryan. Um, the Saints' defense only gave up one big run, and that was to Steven Jackson for 50 yards. Past that, they held him under 100 yards rushing. Uh, Atlanta also did the same, but, I mean, for the most part, Atlanta's got to start running the ball a lot better. Uh, Harry Douglas and Julio Jones were the top receivers because Roddy White was pretty much a decoy thanks to his injury. And uh, the Atlanta defense was decent, but they had no real pass rush outside of Croy Beerman, who was in the backfield quite a bit, but not enough to rattle Breeze, who uh, ended up going 26 for 35 for 357 yards, two touchdowns and interception. Pretty much par for the course on him, too. Both these are elite quarterbacks, and they're going to throw for about 300 every week, usually a couple scores, going to try to minimize the turnovers. Uh, But for the most part, they're the same way. Uh, Not much individual rushing from either team. Uh, Collectively, collectively was really low. I believe it was around 78 yards for New Orleans and around 88 for the Falcons. But when you get a shootout like this, typically there's going to be a lot of balls in the air as opposed to running them on the ground. Uh, Pierre Thomas had 43 yards receiving, or sorry, rushing. Darren Sproles had 22 and Mark Ingram had 11. That's not really where the Saints want to be. They want to they want to probably have, you know, Pierre Thomas maybe with 70, probably 70 to 80. Sproles with uh, 50 to 60 on the ground, but he also returns kicks for him, so a lot of multi-purpose yards there. And Mark Ingram's pretty much their goal line guy for the most part. They're, they're ground and pound. But New Orleans will face Tampa Bay in Tampa Bay this week. Uh, Tampa Bay lost to the Jets 18 to 17 after... Just a, a ridiculous penalty and, and a lot of mistakes, but we'll get into that in a few minutes. Uh, I've actually got New, New Orleans winning 35-13 to 13 over Tampa Bay. Buccaneers fans, don't kill me. I'm getting into you soon. But New Orleans is going to continue to roll. Right now, they're the only team in the division that has a win. So they're currently in first place, but there's 15 more games to go. So, you know, Falcons fans, don't panic. There are things called a wild card where you still get in the playoffs, and in the last few years, wild cards have won the Super Bowl, so it's not a bad thing. But talking about those Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they lost the 18-17 to to the Jets in the New Meadowlands, which is in New Jersey. It, 
I still find it odd that two New York teams share a field in New Jersey, but it seems to work for them. Uh, Josh Freeman completed 50% of his passes for one touchdown and one interception, only 210 yards. Oddly enough, that's kind of par for the course on him, too. Uh, Vincent Jackson actually had seven catches for 154 yards. I like seeing that Vincent Jackson. That's the same one that used to help Phillip Rivers out so much in San Diego. Uh, Mike Williams had four four catches for only 52 yards receiving, but he caught the only, the only Freeman pass in the end zone. And Doug Martin seems to be a little slow out of the gate, but for the most part, I think their problems are on the offensive line as well. He had the 24 carries for 64 yards and a touchdown. At least they're getting the running game kind of started, and they got close enough to score a couple times, but it's just a lot of mental mistakes, and it's a really young team, and they're, they're still trying to get used to a new coach. And there's because of the Freeman situation, it's, it's kind of thrown the whole locker room where I don't think they're all on the same page. But the reason they did lose that game last week was the penalty on Levante David where he hit Geno Smith in the last few minutes right outside of or outside of uh, play and caused the Jets to be in field goal range. Nick Folk hits the 48-yard game winning field goal, and they practically gift at that one for the Jets. But as far as Freeman's concerned, is, do I think his days are numbered in Tampa? I don't know. He did oversleep and miss the team photo this week. He was not voted as a captain for the first time in the last couple of years. Um, there are reports that maybe uh, Greg Schiano uh, did more than count the votes, that maybe he swung them one way or the other. But, I mean, for the most part, I don't know that the locker room is still behind him. But is Mike is Mike Glennon the shoulders the organization want to want to put itself on? Let's, let me tell you a little bit about Mike Glennon. Uh, he was a North Carolina State Wolfpack member from 2008 to 2012. In 08, he was redshirted, which means he doesn't play, but he's still on the team. That way, he still has four years. He can actually physically play on the team as long as he's still enrolled in college there. Um, in 09 and 010, he was the backup to the starting quarterback, who was Russell Wilson. Yes, that Russell Wilson from Seattle. He was the backup to him. Uh, he completed 33 of 52 passes for a little over 300 yards, a touchdown, and two interceptions. In those couple years, the backup, pretty much just garbage time probably. Either they were up big or they were down big. Um, as a junior in 2011, they named him the starter, probably because Russell Wilson was gone. Uh, he also completed 283 of his 453 passes for a little over 3,000 yards, 31 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. Not so bad to be to be at uh, the collegiate level and throw 31 touchdowns. 2012, he completed 330 of his passes for 4,000 yards. Same 31 touchdowns, five more interceptions. He had 17 after all that, which apparently was enough for the Bucks to draft him in the third round, 73rd overall. I think the jury's still out for the most part. If it were up to me, I would stick with Freeman for right now. At, at least for a handful more games until you felt comfortable enough to turn the reins over. If Freeman can't turn it around, then I would ride Mike Glenn until the end of the year and always be on the lookout for somebody else to pick up. Uh, they will play the New Orleans Saints in Tampa this week. I think their defense may still get their sacks. They did have five last week. But can the offense score any points against uh, a middle-of-the-pack Saints defense? I say not many. Once again, I got New Orleans 35, Tampa Bay 13 on that game. I just I think that Tampa Bay went from a uh, you know a perennial six to seven win team to probably going to get a good draft pick by the end of the year. Uh, lastly, we're going to hit on the Atlanta Falcons, who lost 23 to 17 to the Saints. You know we talked about it. The typical Drew Brees day of 300 plus passes, two touchdowns, interception. Uh, the defense allowed under 100 yards rushing combined. Both defenses did. Matt Ryan, 25 for 38 for 304 yards, two touchdowns, the interception. Uh, Steven Jackson had 11 carries for 77 yards, a seven-yard average, which is not bad. But most of it was all in the 150-yard run he had, which was the only big run that the Saints' D gave up. Last year, their defense was the worst in the league. In the four major off defensive categories, they were dead last 
in two of them and next to last in the other ones. So this is a better defense you're going to see. you got to watch out for them. The bright spot was that since Roddy White was the decoy all day, that opened it up for Harry Douglas, who had the four catches for 93 yards. I know he blew up most fantasy leagues, and I actually saw where he was a, he was available at the current moment in the league I'm in. So anybody that wants to watch this last minute, he's still there. Uh, Julio Jones, who also got banged up in the game a little bit, not sure if he's going to play this week. He had the seven catches for 76 yards and a touchdown. Tony Gonzalez only had 36 yards receiving, but he did catch the first touchdown of the game. These guys all look like they're on par. So for the most part, the offense is fine. To me, that offensive line is going to be the difference maker. Their weakness is definitely the tackle positions, which are the bookends of the line. There's a good chance, I think, that Jeremy Trueblood, who used to be a Buccaneer, just recently got picked up by the Falcons, is probably going to get a little bit of playing time this week, even though Lamar Holmes seems to be the guy they're going to go with. But that's going to do it for my, my NFC South preview. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll see you next week.